Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the offering for the saints, for I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brethren so that our boasting about you may not prove vain in this case, so that you may be ready, as I said you would be, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find out that you are not ready, we be humiliated, to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren to go on to you before me and arrange in advance for this gift you have promised, so that it may be ready not as an exaction but as a willing gift. The point is this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that you will always have enough of everything and may provide in abundance for every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your resources and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for great generosity, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the rendering of this service not only supplies the want of the saints, but also overflows in many thanksgivings to God. Under the test of this service, you will glorify God by your obedience in acknowledging the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. This is the word of the Lord. When I was, I was, I was once, I was young once, <laughs> I was a student pastor. Once I was a student pastor. I was a student pastor. Actually, it was a, if you really want to know, it was at Cross Creek Presbyterian Church. Um, and like, like your average 28-year-old idiot, and I, sorry, Ian, I think you're probably close. <laughs> you're not there yet. But, you know, in any case, I was, I was young and foolish. And I had it in my head that I was going to liven up the offering. I had it in my head that I was going to do something interesting, something challenging. So um, <laughs> I, I wanted to, to, to offer a little reminder to that congregation why, why we give, as, as Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 9, right? That each is as he or she is able, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Um, but a familiar verse like that can go in one ear and go out the other. So I figured I'm going to say something that'll, that'll get, that'll interest them. So I stood up and I announced, God does not need your money. I, I paused for effect. I was hoping to be dramatic. (laughs) Uh, but before I could go on to make my, my point, one of the members of the choir shouted out behind me, God may not need it, but the church sure does. (laughs) I learned a valuable lesson that day, which I'll pass on to you for free. (laughs) The valuable lesson I learned that day is don't get creative with the offering. (laughs) No one likes it. Just hand out the plates and sit down. (laughs) Unfortunately, a lot of the the time when when we talk about offerings, when we talk about money in general, we wind up talking nuts and bolts like that, like my heckler did. Right? It, we, it winds up being about the budget sheet. It winds up being about projects that need fund. It winds up being an appeal for here's what's necessary, here's how much there is, here you go. Um, don't get me wrong, there's a place for numbers. There's a place for special appeals, and sometimes you just got to pay the bills. It's true. I thank God for a few dedicated souls in this congregation who, who do that work, who keep track of those things. Um, we, would, we would be lost without Kim and Joanne to do that, just that work of figuring out what's, what's there and, and what's needed. Um, but if that's where we stop, if that's where we stop thinking about such things with this like utilitarian appeal for cash, Um, we almost entirely miss what the Bible has to say about giving. 
See, according to Scripture, and you notice it here from Paul, he spent 2 Corinthians, he, he doesn't have a ton of time to speak to these Corinthians. This is a newly renewed church, right? They had gone through hell and back. They had struggled with gross immorality. They had struggled with false teaching. They had struggled with all of these things. And Paul has called them back to the gospel. He's called them back to Christ. He's called them back to love for one another, to love for truth. And right, and it seems kind of odd to us, because right in the middle of it, he throws in this reminder about a special offering that was being taken for the poor saints in Jerusalem. You remember I mentioned last week, there were all kinds of reasons why there were so many poor Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, part of it was a combination of persecution, a uh, combination of, of persecution along with some of the work of the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem maintained hospitals, maintained orphanages, maintained help for, for widows. Um, there were all kinds of things that required some funding. And... Paul, as he went from church to church through Asia and up into Greece and, Mas and through Macedonia, he, he took, that was his project at each spot. He, he, he set up this offering for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Now, it served a couple of purposes. It did serve to relieve the Christians in Jerusalem. It also served, not very subtly, and this was clearly Paul's intention, it also served to remind these mostly, often in these, some of these places, mostly Gentile Christian believers, non-Jewish Christians, that these Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were their, their brothers and their sisters. And it served to remind the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem that these Gentile Christians out here weren't the unwashed barbarians that they believed, but were their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who loved them and prayed for them and cared for them. So it served that purpose. But Paul goes a whole lot deeper than that here. He, he lays out giving as a profoundly spiritual matter. Giving, as, as the Bible describes it, is not so much about funding this ministry or that ministry or this offering or that offering. Um, it's about bringing a big and important piece of our lives under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Learning to, to give with a glad heart, with a cheerful heart, is a spiritual discipline as essential to our relationship with the Lord as other disciplines like prayer, <laughs> like study. Um, that's why we... we that's why Paul included this, right in the middle of this letter, this appeal for the seemingly utilitarian offering for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. And he, he proposes it as a test, as proof of the love of the Corinthians, the love of the Corinthians for Christ and the love of the Corinthians for the body of Christ as a whole, for the, their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Um, so... So what does the, what, what, what is, what is, why is this a, a spiritual matter? What does the Bible teach us about giving? Well, first, just a couple of words about the how. This is the easy part, the how of, of, of biblical giving, and then a, a few words of encouragement as to why. And um, in other words, what does it teach us? The, the how is really simple. The how is very simple. For starters, we're called to give willingly. Like, if you're grumbling, if you're grumbling and you're, ah, you know, the preacher talking about money again. Well, the preacher's talking about money because I landed in first, Second Corinthians 9, so, you know, blame that. Blame Paul. But uh, I'm always tempted to, when I have something un, that, that I think is going to make people uncomfortable, I'm always tempted to start off by announcing we're going to talk about sex today. And then by the time I get around to talking about money, Everybody, it's a relief. <laughs> Everybody can relax. Oh, thank God, he's not going to talk about that. <laughs> okay, it's a bad plan. Anyway, <laughs> um, I should not have said that. <laughs> Each one must give as he has made up his mind, 
verse 7 here, not reluctantly or under compulsion. See, in other words, your, your motivation matters, right? Your motivation matters. You get no particular spiritual benefit. Let's get this out of the way first. You get no spiritual benefit out of simply dropping a donation in a plate. You get no spiritual benefit, no matter how big it is. You get no spiritual benefit out of giving in order to be seen giving. You get no spiritual benefit out of giving because you feel guilty. None of, if, if that's why you're doing it, stop now. But warn us so we can adjust the budget for next year. <laughs> um, Jesus warns that those who give in order to be seen giving already have their reward. So we're supposed to give willingly. We're called to give willingly. We're called to give out of a desire to please God, not out of guilt or compunction or uh, compulsion, I guess, actually is a better word, or to look better than the next guy. But, okay. All right, preacher. How much? About $10 a week with an annual cost of living adjustment, right? There's no answer. There is no answer. When you ask what's the right amount, there's no answer. You notice here in 2 Corinthians um, where Paul, he's urging this collection for the poor believers in Jerusalem. He doesn't name a figure. There's no goal on this campaign. He doesn't have one of those therm thermostats, or therm not thermostats, ther thermometers, right, with the, the red that goes up. He simply encourages them to give from what they've been given. In other words, our gifts are, are, are proportional to what we've got. To those, from those to whom much is given, Jesus said, much is expected. Now he was talking about spiritual gifts. He was really talking about the law. Those to whom the word of God has been given, much is expected from them. But it, it applies here. Those to whom much is, is given, much is expected from them, and vice versa. Those who have little, little is expected from them. What both Paul and Jesus were talking about um, when they dealt with such things was the Old Testament, the Old Testament commandment to tithe, right? And the tithe was the first 10 percent, whether it was of your harvest or of your profit or whatever. The first 10 percent that was set aside for the work of the Lord, for the, the, the work of the temple in Jerusalem, the maintenance of the temple, for the maintenance of the poor, that sort of thing. Uh, in other words, in ancient Israel, if you made 50 bucks, you gave five dollars to the Lord. It was a simple procedure. If you made 500 dollars, you gave 50 bucks to the Lord. Um, if you made 100,000, you gave 10,000 to the Lord, right? And so forth. It was simple. It was, it was fair. Now, we should say that that Old Testament commandment to tithe is no longer binding in a legal sense on Christians. It's not binding in the legal sense that it was in the Old Testament. It is, however, still held up in the New Testament as the pattern for the discipline of Christian giving. So, um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's the guideline, it's the pattern, it's the model. So if, you, if we want to know how much we're supposed to give, like the biblical answer is to aim at 10%. It really is. It's that simple. Now, people ask me, okay, is that gross or, or net? <laughs> I loved Sarah's grandfather gave the best answer to that. It was, it was, do you expect gross or net blessings from the Lord? <laughs> Which I thought was terrific. Um, I'll give you my answer. I don't care. I tell people, if, I, I, I'm interested that you're giving to the work of the kingdom. If you want to send all your money, and you can go through, there's a couple of organizations, uh, Voice of the Martyrs is one. If you want to send all your money next week to the relief of Christian refugees in Lebanon, knock yourself out. Please do. God bless you. Um, I'm not going to be picky. <laughs> but that's the model. That's the model. So much for the, that's the how. As long as it's for the, the mission, the ministry of, of Christ, we give as we are able, and as we read from Malachi, the Lord invites us to put him to the test, to take him up on the offer. Find a worthy mission and invest in it. 
so much for the how. Um, the how is, is pretty straightforward, okay? Supposed, supposed to give a, a, a portion of what we've been given willingly off the top, right? But why is this a spiritual discipline? Why is this a spiritual discipline? How does giving 10% to the church or to some other, other mission help us to grow in the love and the knowledge of Jesus Christ? That's the real question. At least that's the important one. The first answer to that is the most obvious, and, and here it is. This is the method that God has chosen to provide for the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's true. Um, we're promised that when the gospel is preached faithfully, when Jesus Christ is proclaimed without fear or apology, lives are changed. How are they to call on him in whom they have not believed, Paul asked, 10th chapter of Romans. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? The tithe is God's method of funding that work. It is. The second spiritual benefit is pretty obvious, too, I think. Um, the discipline of tithing for the work of the kingdom is a constant reminder to us that what we have is not our own, but is a gift of God to us. You, you can say that you already know that, and I hope you do, but it doesn't hurt to demonstrate it once in a while. I have known plenty of people, almost all of them men, <laughs> who insisted that they spent every waking moment working hard to get what they had for their families. And when they get a day off, they want to spend it doing what they want. There's something deeply wrong with that. Um, setting time aside just for your family doesn't deny that you are working for them the rest of the week. It confirms it. Same thing applies here. Setting aside from what the Lord has given us for his purposes doesn't deny his love for us. It confirms it. We say with the, the, the 24th Psalm that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Giving willingly for the work of God proves it. Third, a third spiritual blessing of biblical giving, and this one's a little less obvious, it's that it teaches us to be content with what we have. This is incredibly hard for a lot of people. Um, we've been raised on commercials, right? What is the advertising business? What is the point of advertising? The whole point of advertising is to convince you that whatever you've got, you need this in addition. Right? There's always one more thing that you need. We are, we are easily, and I'm going to nail down people under 40 here, we are easily the most materialistic generation who has ever lived. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, how do you find fulfillment? You surround yourself with stuff. It's the air we breathe. One of the glorious things, one of the beautiful things about the discipline of tithing is that every single time we write a check, every single time we put some, some cash in an envelope for uh, this mission or that mission, um, every single time we have to forego something else that we want. You got to give up the toy. It teaches us obedience to the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet. And it tests us again and again and again. Who do you love more? What do you love more? A new phone or the kingdom of God? The latest video game or the poor? <laughs> God's answer to covetousness, at least in part, is the commandment to give. 
Well, and the last, the last spiritual blessing, spiritual benefit here to biblical giving, and, and this again is pretty simple, is that it teaches us to rely more fully on God to provide for us. That sounds bizarre, you give to get. Um, but look at Malachi 3, verse 10. Third chapter of Malachi, verse 10, the Lord says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. I, I can't really explain that. I should warn you that this is not saying that if you give, you will be, you know, you don't give in order to get. You don't give in order to, to you know, it's not, you're not planting a seed to reap the riches or anything like that. What I am saying is that sometimes he puts us in a position where to give is going to be a real sacrifice. And it's going to require some trust. It's going to require trusting him to provide. And he invites us to put him to that test. I can't explain it. I can only tell you that it works. Um... So, so this is our, our commandment, to give willingly. Now, this was the commandment for these Corinthians, giving to this relief for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. It's a command to us when, we're, we're, when we're, we're giving out of our, again, out of our time, when we're giving out of, out of the, the material blessings that we've been given, when we're giving out of our, our efforts for work, service to the poor, for service to the needy, for the proclamation of the gospel, all of these things, we are called to give willingly, to make it a habit, to take up the Lord on his offer to put him to the test, to support the preaching of the gospel. So f to find a, a faithful mission or ministry and invest in it, not to be seen, but out of gratitude to God for all that he's given. So give. Make it a goal. Make it a discipline. Test and see that the Lord is good. Amen.